control. <laughs> I'm good. Content warning. The following episode makes mention of eating disorder. If this is a sensitive topic for you, please proceed accordingly and take care. Hey, welcome to the Skaterade podcast. I'm Jasmine. I'm Mac. Good to be here. And we're here with Skate Witch. Yes, very excited about this interview. In fact, it is our first. Our very first interview. Yeah. We're so glad to have you here. You said you worked most of today. Yeah, I did. Uh, It was pretty low key, but I work in a warehouse sometimes and there's no AC or heat. So right now it's probably like 95 with like an 80% humidity. Yeah. Whoa. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So have you eaten? Have you hydrated? How are we on that front? We even got a shower in before this. So I'm feeling good right now. (laughs) Certainly. So, um, for folks who don't know you, uh, maybe you could just, you know, give us your name, maybe some of the names you're called in community pronouns and, and you know, tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah. Uh, so on the internet, I am known as Skate Witch. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, people in the Derby community know me as Smack Mamba. And otherwise, you can just call me Kathleen. You know, I've been skating for like almost a decade, which feels kind of crazy. So, you know, here we are. <laughs> And can you say anything about some of the like kinds of work that you do? So I have some DIY experience. We have a local spot here in Richmond, Virginia called Texas Beach, sometimes also called Nacho Beach. (laughs) And I've started kind of when I met my partner, just working on, you know, concrete sidewalks and slabs and foundations. And I've only gotten to do like a handful of like DIY builds. But like anytime I go somewhere, I'm like, hey, you know, like what's the local DIY? I want to check it out. I find a lot of beauty and the creativity that goes behind it. And also there's something to be said about experiencing a park that like is clearly the only thing that people can to skate in their area. And it might be super rough, but then of course you get like these incredible rippers who like come through and then like destroy the best way and they're making the best (laughs) of it. And I, I find it really cool. I'm a big advocate for skate parks currently trying to get one but i should say i'm trying to encourage a better quality park build here in richmond for an area that's on the outskirts of town so you know i try to like get in the ears of city council folks and everything like that and you know work alongside my partner a lot with that kind of stuff uh they have much more yeah than i do <laughs> so uh, i've done some community outreach projects with roller skating I also do humanitarian aid work as my real job, which has been fun over the past few years. I'm a little bit all over the place. I definitely travel a lot. I joke that I'm running away from my problem. (laughs) I'm, you know, trying to experience and see as many skate parks as possible. I feel like it improves my skating, but I'm also accruing knowledge of how parks can be built in that way too. Like, what did I like about this? What did I not like about it? I like playing the game now of when I go places, trying to figure out who built the park before I actually research it, just based on like, yeah. designs and then hopefully you know one day i'd love to do something where maybe i take that knowledge and also tie humanitarian aid work and maybe i get to build parks or maybe i get to advocate for parks in different countries i don't know that's hopefully the next step in like my journey yeah, that's so cool you know and tonight we have some questions for you about some of that stuff people that aren't around diy don't know how special it is when you're skating with diy park it's like okay i have to get more creative because of some of the obstacles yeah. we're working with, <laughs> even in terms of both like building and skating them, right? Yeah, there's something to be yeah. said about not being able to do a basic stall in the roughest park ever. <laughs> but then when you do get something, it feels huge. <laughs> and I think it's good to keep you humble and also to make you appreciate what you have if you do have a really nice quality park near you. Do you find that chasing new DIY skate spaces has made you a more adaptive skater? I think so. I think it's more of a common thing too, just being on the East Coast. And I've talked to some Midwest skaters that experience it as well. Like we don't have Midwest baby. Yes. Absolutely. I'm always saying the same thing. <laughs> yeah, we just don't have like an abundancy of like quality parks like they do specifically in California and out west in general. The Pacific Northwest also has an abundancy of really beautiful parks. We have to travel a bit further and the wear and tear of like our weather will kind of destroy them a little bit faster, especially if you're in a beach town where there's sand and stuff. So yeah, I think it it has made me like push myself a bit harder because, you know, I'll see the difference. Like I might visit one park one year and come back a year later and I'll be 
able to recognize that like, hey, I was able to go a lot faster. What am I not doing properly? What's changed with me? Or maybe it's just that I feel more impressed with myself because I got something new. It's always exciting. That's the thing. I, there's certain parks that I go to that I'm just like, you can't <laughs> expect the park to do exactly what you want it to. And so you just kind of have to like skate and let whatever happens happens and just be prepared for possibly a really upsetting gnarly fall. But <laughs> I enjoy that. It's not for everybody. <laughs> yeah. The way that you talk about skate parks is really poetic and the way you kind of connect them to the natural world and the surroundings of the skate park and how you utilize them as a community space. Would you like to share a little bit about your relationship to specific skate parks and different ones that you've worked on? Yeah, um, the Texas Beach one is definitely the most active one that we've dealt with. And even recently, it's, in my opinion, become a bit more of a boys club, and it's been a little bit harder for me to get in on my days off to go over there and help. But it's kind of a free-flowing idea of like, oh, we have like this crew that has concrete knowledge we think that this specific feature would fit here and open up the park in a new way and pretty much if you're willing to make all the calls to get the concrete delivered like therefore you doing it as long as it's like a group consensus from the people that have been doing it from beginning at least i've worked on that there's a park in charlotte north carolina area called goat pen i would say that's more of a it's a diy it's um owned by this great guy named seamus and his family it's a bmx community but that was probably one of the first few builds I got to work with and stuff. And even then, I just remember kind of hanging out and watching everybody work more than anything else. And I saw a kid who was 10 who just looked like an expert, like out there with his dad, you know, running things and stuff. It's, so it's been cool to see that. And I know there's been other things that I've worked on, too, because I get so excited about it. And of course, I'm like losing it, but they'll come to me. But I did a skate park for a short amount of time when I first started skating and I got to witness kids that their parents may have been working, you know, long hours and they didn't have anybody at home. And so they would come to the skate park to kill time. And it was more of a safe haven for them. And I really try to, when I talk to these city council folks, bring up those stories because I think there's a stigma against skaters in general of that were whackers or, you know, all these other possible things. And it's like, realistically, it takes a lot of guts to fall down and get up and do the same thing over and over again. And if a kid is coming to a park at a young age and experiencing that firsthand, imagine the determination that they're going to have on their own without anyone like kind of hovering over them and stuff. Look, you know, that's from somebody who's been following you, right, for like, you know, a couple of years. I feel like we get a glimpse into this with your social media, but just hearing you talk about (laughs) it in such detail, I think is so cool. I'm seeing you light up in this way that I think is like so special. You know, I wish people could see it too. Hopefully they hear (laughs) it. I'm sure that they do. Right. Like, that's how I think of it. It's like you ask this question and then I'm like, oh, but then all of these things are why I 100%. love skate parks and why I've loved skating. And I, it's not just about me. And I've said this before about DIY spots is getting to participate in a DIY project feels it really special because it's not about what I'm going to. Yeah, it's great. I get to skate it afterwards. Awesome. But it's more I find it cool that there might be some kid that that's their first skate park experience. And then maybe that kid becomes the next pro. And I have been a part of their experience without even them interacting with me. Gotten to do some like renegade DIY stuff that I wouldn't really say are skate park related, but one of the like cooler things, it's gone now. So I can like talk about it openly. But I remember (laughs) like maybe two years ago now, it might've only been a year ago we got like a phone call from a friend who was like, hey, this person I know is in a wheelchair and their landlord will not install a ramp that leads into the street. And so they were like, I kind of just want to go and build it. And so we just literally mixed up some concrete in the middle of the night, drove there, poured it real fast, you know, kind of tried to smooth it out as much as we could. And then we just left and (laughs) fixed the solution right then and there. It did end up getting torn out. We've noticed like we drove by trying to see if it was still there a couple months later and stuff. But you know, it was like a little thing that we could do that was really cool. And honestly, it was probably my favorite project that I've come to. <laughs> it's like bad, but like helping somebody and kind of being like, am I allowed to swear on this? By the way, I should have asked that. Yeah. Absolutely. But just kind of being like, <laughs> fuck you to that landlord at the same time, being like, if you're not going to help this person, like we're going to help them. And like, 
it shouldn't have to be those many steps for that to happen. You know, and, and again, right, it's like, okay, maybe it did get torn out eventually, but how much did it maybe improve the quality of that person's yeah. life for the amount of time that it was there? And I feel that way about every DIY park. Yeah, no, because like, that's the thing. It For a short amount of time, right? Like DIYs, yeah. there's no guarantee that they will be there permanently. And I think that kind of also at least how I view it is like, it's more of a reason to try things and push myself when I go to DIY spaces, because maybe I've got this trick in mind. And if I don't push myself to do it, I may never have the chance to do it again there. And I won't know that for sure. I've, I know when I went to um, Portland, there was a DIY called St. John's that was extremely scary looking. It just was like this dirt bowl (laughs) in the middle of like St. John's like neighborhood, Portland. And uh, I had torn my hamstring, didn't really want to drop in on it. But I knew I didn't know if I'd get to come back. And so I dropped in on it. And sure enough, like three months later, it was torn out. Like they just ripped the whole thing out. So, yep. I mean, maybe somebody else wouldn't regret that, but I re- would have regretted it if I didn't skate it. So Yeah, so it sounds to me like the DIY spaces are definitely the super ephemeral sort of thing, potentially. But at the same time, you talked a lot about the legacy that you might leave behind even if it's not something physically tangible how would you want people to think of you as a skater as a page in the you know skater history book oh ah that's really hard because you know so I had this pro wheel that came out and stuff and then I you know dropped my sponsors but in a way I feel like people have already kind of forgotten that and it's really cool to be the first but I I always think about people like um, Irene King and Duke Rennie and Jay and like all these great old school skaters, right, who have already gone through this process that like a lot of the skate community is trying to get into now in a different light. Like we have social media, so, you know, it's more at our hands. But these folks, you know, they've already done like tours and done commercials and done demos and things like that. And I really do think that in some ways, if CIB hadn't become a thing and Trample hadn't started to put a light on those skaters, we probably wouldn't have seen their names get as circulated as they are now. You know, obviously they get invited to do camps and stuff. They're all great people, by the way. Like, I hold them at like the highest regard. (laughs) But it's something to think about. Like, if social media was to disappear for some reason, who knows, especially in the state of the world today. If we didn't have access to the internet, like, would any of this matter? Would, like, my Instagram following, would any of that even make a difference, you know? And and, and realistically, it's not. Like, it's not changing the world. But at the end of the day, 20 years from now, probably no one's going to remember any of it. So I think that's part of the other reason I care about community projects more is because it's, it's not so much about being famous and getting your name out there. Like, to me... Yeah, I might have been remembered as like a cool skater, but I think it's much more important for people to remember things that you're doing that are helping others, just trying to take care of each other. And whenever my time comes and I'm no longer skating, I would rather people remember me because of how I affected them as a person one-on-one or maybe it was a class that they, they took with me that was something I said stuck with them. You know, it's that that kind of stuff to me is much more of a greater importance. And I think the pandemic should have really showed everybody that in a lot of ways. But that's just personally how it's been for me of trying to focus on what am I doing to support my friends, my family, the people that I care about, skaters that I want to see highlighted. Yeah, so. It's so refreshing to hear you say that because I went through the same thing. I had sponsorship. I was really well known in roller derby for a while, but there's just a lot of pressure when you're in that position. And then when you're not really being paid for it, I mean, you're, you're benefiting. Certainly I was always putting everything I had into roller derby and then sort of seeing some of the social dynamics, you know, around some of that stuff was just really hard for me. I've had a lot of injuries. Now I have a lot of chronic pain. I had also had to step away from sponsorship and it is, it's kind of like new people step up and people get excited about those people. And there's just a revolving door and you do kind of get, you know, forgotten it in the last few years, I've pivoted in much the same way where I've been like, I just want to have relationships locally with people that just I feel like I can be more real with where the influence actually is different because it's more tangible to me in some ways than social media. Like someone's reading my words, they're excited about what I'm doing, but they don't really know me. And how much am I really affecting change? Because we don't really have a relationship. It's a parasocial relationship. It's a weird line to walk and it's kind of weird to step away. It's tough too, because as a derby person as well, 
I have seen so many people leave this sport and lose so much of themselves in that process or not know how to adjust, (laughs) especially if you've dedicated years. I've seen people also lose their friends. In Derby, you spend years building these relationships with your teammates and things like that. And then when someone retires or gets injured, it is so quick sometimes that people can just be left at the wayside. For me, I've always just said that whenever I do retire, whether that's from Derby or Park Scene, I like to think that I'm going to skate forever, but you know, (laughs) bodies will do what they do. (laughs) But I've always said I don't ever want to feel bitter about it. And so I just want to make sure that I'm at a good place whenever that time comes that if I walk away, it's like, no, I've got I have other things I want to do. And I have other things to fill my time that fulfill me as much. And park skating definitely does that because it's just on my own schedule and there's no regimen to it. I put into it what I want to get out of it. You know, derby is that way in, in a lot of aspects, but it is a team sport. And so you have people depending on you and you can't just... Yeah, I don't really feel like doing this today. Okay, bye. I mean, you can, but it's not going to go over well. Yeah, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head with a lot of these things, too. Some of my physical stuff kind of is forcing me to move away from roller derby. But, and like, I've changed a lot as a person in the last 10 years. And so I'm like, I want to rhythm skate. I want to do something that's lower impact that I'm actually really excited about. And I don't necessarily feel like I'm leaving with anger or bitterness, which feels really good. Yeah. Not to say it's not hard or there's not mixed feelings, but yeah, I feel very aligned with a lot of what you're saying. It's been like real close to my heart because I've come back to my league and I've seen like an influx of new skaters that are also bright eyed and fresh. And, you know, they're going to be the ones that really take over our league probably within the next year, honestly. And so where does that leave folks like me? It's up to me. I have to decide how much I want to be a part of that. And I can either sit around and be mad or, you know, whatever. I'm not mad. About <laughs> they're, they're all great. But like, <laughs> and change is hard. And yeah. so I'm like already mentally preparing myself to be like, okay. It's, it's okay. We're going to see how things play out and take it day by day and just try to focus on enjoying yourself. It's not the end of the world if someone gets on the team and you don't or something like that. None of this has come up at this point, but I'm just already like going through the motions of like pep talking myself, you know, just in case. <laughs> As a pandemic skater, it's really illuminating to hear y'all talk about your skating careers and all the ups and downs that you've been through. Because I think there, there's a lot to be said about histories that you guys carry and I feel like that legacy like you were saying is definitely something more enduring than any physical space certainly what you've imbued to newer skaters like myself is invaluable (laughs) (laughs) you have to ask yourself like what you want out of it you know and that's like a continuous question it's going to constantly change and asking yourself what it's worth like if you're someone that's aiming for sponsorships and stuff okay well why do you want that though what are your expectations with that and what does that success look like to you and unfortunately i think it's you can want certain things all you want but then the reality of the situations behind the scenes are going to be very different. And so just keeping that in mind of just respecting yourself and respecting your own wishes. It's just trying to stay true to who I am and not allowing Instagram, social media, all that to change who I am as a person. I've seen people lose themselves completely to their online personality and stuff. And I don't ever want to be that way. I've never seen a point in separating my life into two separate Instagrams or anything like that. I'm very much like this is all of me and if you don't like it then you can leave yeah. mostly as skating but i also am like that's kind of all i do anyways for the most part yeah. yeah so in reference to skating being all you do i read on your instagram that you typically don't feel comfortable in your skin when you're not on skates and i'm really curious about how it is that you're able to kind of manage that feeling yeah, I would say it's like still an ongoing thing. Um, for like disclosure, uh, I have like bulimia and have struggled with that since I was a kid. I didn't realize until I was an adult that all of it was triggered by early anxiety signs. Things like not wanting to go wait in line for lunch because I was scared I would like drop my tray in front of people and things like that. Or and some for some reason also not wanting to pack lunch and then just not eating and then you know, going home and indulging and things like that. I've just been carrying that my entire life. There's like also an aspect of like, I I feel like I have always been extremely sexualized by other people in my life, even if I am not an outwardly sexual person. And I think a lot of it just has to be, it has to do with probably having like a herbaceous figure and stuff. So 
I've always been really aware of other people like viewpoint of me, I guess. And it's not necessarily how I view myself. It makes me uneasy on top of having anxiety and linking that with other mental health stuff like having depression. It just is constantly being critical and unsure of myself. But with skating, it's it's been so grounding for me and really just allowed me to push my body in ways that I didn't know was possible. I wanted to play sports as a kid. My family was not supportive of the idea. You know, I fell into roller derby sort of and then kind of stumbled into park skating on top of it, like literally almost fell into all these things. I also had just gotten out of a really abusive relationship and had just like mental health, like crisis stay in like a hospital months before all this and just kind of found derby by accident on the flyer that was probably no more than like a couple inches, you know what I mean? And went to an open house and just have been doing it since then. The women that I encountered in the derby community were so, derby was kind of different at this time too. It was very intense and kind of aggressive. I kind of needed someone to kick my ass. I didn't know it. I'm so grateful for those women and for my coaches I had when I first started, because if they hadn't been hard on me, I probably would have just quit. I'm a very much a person that's like, when you tell me I can't do something, I'm like, well, I'm gonna do it and make you watch kind of thing. It's just really helped my self-confidence. It's helped me better understand myself. And I think it started in derby and then with park skating, I just, it was like a thing I could do on my own and clear my head. Um, you know, I used to joke that if I learned a new trick or had a really hard fall, then I could like take myself out for a treat afterwards and then like kind of like take better care of myself in that way, being like, oh, I'm proud of you, even if no one else saw it, like kind of thing. I just want other people to feel that way. So I think when I put on my skates, it's like, hey, it's changed my life. I want to encourage you because it's going to probably change your life too. And I don't know what it is about roller skates that does that to us. I, I think it's like this closest thing you can feel to flying probably and source of freedom and just being able to like get out and go. So yeah, I don't know. It's It's been definitely an ongoing struggle, but I feel so much better and feel like my full true self when I skate both good and bad. With derby, there's this highly aggressive side that I get to like display that it can sometimes be a negative thing, but a lot of times it's a great thing. And with park skating, it's much more flowy and loose and I can be aggressive, but I feel like I just really tune into music a lot of the times when I park skates. So that kind of is like going to set the scene for whatever I'm feeling in that moment. But I'm really fascinated by like human duality. And I think skating is a way for me to see that in myself a little clearer versus in my everyday life where I'm going through the motions of work and everything. Thank you for, you know, sharing some of that. We spend a lot of time on the road, we've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it sounds like luckily you enjoy your own company. I don't know that just anyone can do that. Was that a relationship you had to develop with yourself or is that something that came really naturally to you? Yeah, so I do have a brother, but I would say I spent most of my childhood by myself anyways, just super toxic background and spent a lot of time reading books. I assume that that is the only reason I turned out the way I did. I like to joke that it's a good thing, hopefully. <laughs> I just kind of didn't really have much of an option. There were no other kids for me to go and play with for the most part. My family was not down to take me over to my friend's house. I didn't really cultivate a lot of friendships until I was probably in the eighth grade. I just kind of got used to spending a lot of time alone. And as an adult, you know, found roller derby and had a source of friends through that. They were the first ones to take me on a road trip. And suddenly when I started park skating, it was, oh, well, I want to go and stop at this really cool skate park that I saw that's on the way to this game. So I'm just going to drop myself and got to determine my own time and schedule. And now that I've been doing it for a while, I find that I spend so much time on the road just reflecting and it's almost the only space at times where I can just like zone out and really tap into stuff that's been on my brain and ask myself why those things are bothering me or maybe how I want to approach a situation coming up and things like that. So it is just me sitting there having conversations with myself, but I think it's being comfortable being on my own schedule. I've also always had roommates and things like that too. I've never had my own place to myself. So I think that's part of it as well, just being like, Oh, I can be alone. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but I think it's a little, yeah. I'm just like, I feel like I'm always around people. Uh, my partner will tell you that I, he's like first thing up in the morning wants to talk. And I'm like, no, I need coffee in like two hours and then we can have a conversation. So I think I just am like a very 
solitary person a lot of time, almost to a fault. Like I, I'm really grateful for my friends that continuously invite me out, even if it takes a lot to get me out the door and stuff. And, you know, I feel like we can both relate to that. <laughs> yeah, it's the phrase of, uh, I want you to invite me. I probably won't show up, but please invite me. Well, yes, no. <laughs> yeah. Like my love language is like people inviting me and also having it be okay that I say yes, no, but exactly. that's like we always go together. <laughs> I think you bring up a good point about morning chatter too. If I could have a rule to not talk for the first <laughs> hour I'm awake, that would be great. Yes, that was good for me. Yeah, yeah. This last trip, I've only been home like, like four days, I think, or something. Said, it felt like better even though I was on the road for a little bit less and I think it almost was a spiritual experience I didn't have a single bad day on the road every day was meaningful and impactful even on the ones when I was completely alone but just little experiences that made a huge difference to me and just made me really grateful that I even got to be in places it's also surreal to dream of visiting a space for me it was the badlands on this trip and so then getting there and getting there alone and then sitting there in this amazingly beautiful space and just being like i just drove myself out here yeah. what is happening right now it messes with you in like the best way so yeah something i observed in following your instagram was that you for a while you were doing really regular mutual aid stuff yeah i was really inspired by the ways that that was a very regular practice in a way for you right and I am a little curious about like what got you into mutual aid in the first place. You know, it sounds like you hold it very near and dear to your heart. Well, one of my first jobs, I should say, out of school was working for the Boys and Girls Club. When I was there, a lot of the Boys and Girls Clubs have in-school programs. Those programs typically have backpack programs where a child will receive like so many items of food to take home for the weekend just in case they don't have that food at home or... Maybe there's a reason further behind that and stuff. But that was like my first time seeing that and being aware of those situations. And from there, my first league, Rocktown Rollers, they required volunteer hours outside of the league. And so we were going to the food bank. We were doing roadside cleanups. And it just became something really integral to me. And then as I continued to work with kids in other places like daycares, I tried to instill a sense of community outreach in those kids off the bat. So we would do things like we're going to focus on the SPCA this week and we would make dog treats. And then our special field trip would be we're going to go take these homemade dog treats to the SPCA. They get to see the dogs. They get all excited. Right. But they also get to be a part of that. So I think like, yeah, I would attribute my first league and working with the Boys and Girls Club as this first experience with that. My family also went through two really significant tragedies when I was a kid. My mom was in a super serious car accident that put her in the ICU for over six months. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was real bad. And then, like, when I was a senior, my brother was in a burn accident that put him in the hospital at the Shriners, like, Children's Hospital for several months a year. And that was really awful as well. They both are doing great now but the community just like out for them and I still encounter people that remember my mom or my brother and will give me like these big hugs and talk about like oh your, your family's so strong and all these things but realistically it's we just did what we had to do and if those community members hadn't stepped up and tried to help us out I can't imagine the situation we would have been in medical bill wise alone you know I can't say what it was exactly that showed me that I needed to start doing that but I think it's just more of like all these people have done so much for us we should be doing stuff back. So it's just been a part of how I am. The The mutual aid post, I feel like I should bring back at some point. And I probably honestly will with the way things are looking right now. Like I know that there's potential we're going to go into a recession. So I would expect there to be several skaters that need help with medical bills if they get injured, housing issues, things like that. I think anytime I've seen like an influx of ghost bunnies and things like that, I try to just use those posts to centralize them. And then if people have the funds to distribute, then they could be like, here's a bunch of options where you can help. If anything, it gets more eyes on it. I'm just like going in a bunch of different directions. We love it. Because all of it like <laughs> ties in. But like yeah. when um, the Black Lives Matter protests happened here in Richmond, the first time I felt truly connected to the city of Richmond was actually by going to these things called teach-ins that were being hosted by some of the activists that were organizing stuff in town. And... I had no idea that there were certain groups that existed past the food bank that were just already doing things, like providing like AC units to people that started community fridges, that just all these different aspects of just helping one another, because at the end of the day, we have to take care of each other. And obviously, 
not for the political, but the government doesn't give a shit about us. Oh, so no. it's up to us to take care of our neighbors. Been here four years. And that was probably the first time that I felt like I was a part of the city and the community. And it just made me want that more. I've tried to encourage my league to start doing stuff like that, you know. And again, I, I deal with it every day at work. As well. That side of it too. But yeah, all those things. <laughs> tie in together i just feel like you know we take care of us and we have to like continuously push that and because if we don't no one else is going to so and i think you're right it's all connected and there's kind of the nonprofit sphere but then again it's this this whole other realm of diy mutual aid shit that and those things hit differently like i've done mental health counseling and through sort of nonprofit organizations and stuff and there's still a lot of barriers for people there's still a lot of gates that people have to get through just to access services some of those other pieces that you're talking about like other organizations that are working locally and stuff can be so meaningful so seeing and hearing how you're connected in all these different levels and different ways is is really cool we have some questions about like just kind of like what it's like to engage in with social media with social media very complicated relationship i hate it most days i think most people do even if they want to admit it <laughs> The only reason I actually started an Instagram is because my friend Chris Garrity was a skater from the Eastern Shore in Maryland, and he was taking photos of us at like these CIB meetups when we first started, and they were all great. One day he was like, "You gotta, you gotta make an Instagram because if you don't, I'm not gonna have anywhere to put these photos. I need you to have one so I have a place for my photos." He was totally picking at me and stuff about it, but I ended up starting one, and I had. Been going to the skate park already for maybe a year and a half to two years at that point, which I think is important because a lot of people are starting their skate journey from the very beginning. And mine actually did not start as far as the online presence did not start until maybe a year and a half afterwards. And I think that's important because people reach out and just be like, you know, y'all, it comes easily to you. No, I had to work at it just as much. I just didn't present it online. So posting like things like your bails and stuff, I think people really like it resonates with them. It's like a reality check of like, okay, we all fall down. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I go through waves of how I feel about social media. Most of the time, I would get in the habit of comparing myself to others, especially when I was sponsored, just being like, well, my teammates doing this, I should be able to keep up with them. Or am I going to be forgotten about if I can't do this trick? It would just make me kind of resent skating. And I never want to feel that way. It all like ties into with like going through bouts of like depression and like mental health stuff. But currently feeling good about it just because I've been skating and doing things that I love for me. And I want to share that with people, whether that's a picture of me at like a national park or falling off of that full pipe that I posted. Like, you know, like just if the content is more fun and I think that resonates with people more. So I've got a better situation with it at the moment. I still don't know what people on the internet like, though. I'll put together this really cool edit that I'll be all proud of, and then nobody likes it. And then I'll put one of me doing something that I was like, whatever, I just need to post this to get it off my phone. And people love it. What do y'all want? <laughs> it's hard to know. Yeah. As a newer skater who is following you, I think that your approach to talking about things makes those achievements seem so much more accessible because, you know, you're talking about your process, you're talking about maybe not even seeing your own progress in the moment and then looking back at videos and seeing that and just kind of embracing the bales and maybe turning the bale into a trick. And I just think that that's such a healthy approach to skating because it's so easy to get defeated during a, a session. And it's definitely something that I struggle with as a newer skater. Yeah, I find that I'm not a big fan of competitions, which I know are a big topic right now. I'm yeah. a fan of them because I do feel like there are so many things in the skate community that we have to like address. And one of those things is how we treat each other at skate parks. I have known quite a few skaters that have told me terrible stories of the interactions they've had with their group of quote unquote friends treating them terribly. They're just like, but they're the only people I have to skate with. And I'm like, well, why are you subjecting yourself to hanging out with these folks that don't treat you well? Also, anyone that's doing that, please stop. It's not that serious. That's the other thing is yeah. it's not that serious. Like, it's skating and I love it with every aspect of my being. But it's also my hobby. I'm not making a ton of money on it. I'm doing it for fun. So the moment I stop having fun, it's kind of like a reality check of like, okay, if you're not having fun, you need to figure out why and you need to like, remedy that because otherwise, what's the point? You're supposed to be enjoying yourself. You're supposed to be silly. And also, it's not fun to skate with somebody that takes themselves too seriously. It really sounds like your relationship in this moment of time is on your terms. Uh, yeah, I'll say this. I think sponsorship stuff. 
when you start fucking with somebody else's livelihood, meaning you're skating for a brand that's making an income off of the content that you produce, it's a very different ball game. And I really wish people would realize that. It's great to be on a team if you feel supported and you're getting out of it what you're expecting. But the moment that people are like pitted against each other, the moment that you're criticized for the type of skating you're doing when it's like, well, you asked me to be on your team because you liked my skating. Like, you know, things like that. I think those are very, very common issues. Maybe they're not so blatant and like said directly to people, but it's definitely a feeling that I think majority of sponsored skaters I've spoken to have experienced at some point. And so you're a product at that point and how you want to display yourself suddenly is very critical. And it's not as fun as it's all cracked up to be. There are obviously great benefits. I'm very grateful for the experiences I've had being a sponsored skater. I would probably go back to being sponsored at some point, but currently I am just having a good time and I feel like I'm skating better because I'm just having a good time. For sure. You know, speaking of the commodification of people, you know, in these spaces, right, you become a product at some point, right? There's There's an expectation around performance. There's an expectation around output. I am curious. You've also kind of talked about like some injury stuff. It seems like that has been a thread for you over time. And that's something you've had to navigate. And I'm wondering if you could speak about that at all and trying to navigate that, but not just as a sponsored skater, but also as a human who loves to skate, I guess would want to be on your skates and not taking time off. I've been really fortunate. I've had injuries, but I would say I've not yet, hopefully never experienced like a break. I've destroyed my knees. They're doing great currently, but one of them was damaged from not skating with knee pads on, which I will never do again unless it's a rink situation at this point. The other one, my knee pad fell down and caused me to directly hit it on concrete. So that specific one kept me from walking for a week. And then there were long-term issues I had to like deal with, like stretching it still if I take a certain fall in a certain direction and my knee pads aren't doing their job for some reason. I couldn't even put weight on my knees on the ground because the fluid just would build up and never go away. I broke my pinky last year, which is the most minuscule of injuries, but they put this super long soft cast on me. So I couldn't like risk falling on my arm and all being connected and stuff. Uh, That was not a fun experience. I was excited when I found out I could still do cartwheels, but I did not commit to my physical therapy like I was supposed to. For anyone that is injured and is trying to feel better about things, I have seen a number of people have incredibly severe breaks and ACL ruptures, and they've come back and skating better than ever. It's not going to be the case for everybody, but if anyone's listening and feeling super discouraged about being injured right now, like there is definitely a network of people that have gone through the exact same thing as you that have experienced that same traumatic experience of feeling isolated and down on yourself. So turn to those folks. I also really encourage people that are a part of the community that facilitate state events to make sure those people are still taken care of. We have in the past tried to do a pool. We're going to secretly get together a Venmo for them. Everybody send whatever you can. I've gone and like purchased things that would make them feel better that are not skating related, like puzzles and books and movies and letters from us, tea, things that would just make them recognize that they are still appreciated. Because at some point, we will probably all get injured doing this. We're not immune to it. I would love to sit here and be like, I'm never going to experience a break, but I feel like it's a matter of when. (laughs) So, you know, hopefully not though. I feel like I'm jinxing myself. (laughs) Some of this is like disability wisdom too, right? It's how to adapt when someone acquires an impairment or a disability, right? It's like, yeah, so creative. Yeah, and also acknowledging that everybody's body is different. I meet so many new people that come to take a class from me and they'll be like, oh, well, how do I do it this way or properly? Realistically, there's not a wrong way to do any of this. It's a matter of, are you being safe, is my opinion. I know that there will definitely be other people that'll say like, no, there's definitely a proper way to do this or that. And I know people get really wrapped up in trick names, but I personally am like, if you feel good and you're having a good time, that's all that should matter. As long as you are not putting yourself at serious risk, then make whatever it is that you're doing and how you skate, make that your style. You know what I mean? I get people that ask about that a lot. Can you teach a style class or something? I'm like, I don't feel like that's something you teach. But embracing what feels right to you and your stance or your carving ability or how you jump and making it your own is going to be way cooler anyways. That's the only thing about coaching. I love coaching, but like I do feel bad when people are like, 
oh, but I do it this way. And I'm like, well, you should keep doing it that way. Yeah. And I think that approach to coaching just makes it so much more accessible because if you're just always being told that you're doing it wrong while you're having fun, it just kind of kills the joy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen that in Derby too. I wish that I had been told that you're going to end up making it your own. I feel like when you come into Derby, there's this conversation about being really stiff to like take an impact from somebody. And now that I've been skating for a few years, I'm like, no, like use how to counter that movement, use their momentum and flow off their body and feel more fluid basically versus the stiff waiting for something terrible to happen. I see a lot of people come into the park scene from Derby that carry that with them. And I'm like, just breathe, loosen up, it's okay. A lot of people do think there is very much a right way to walk or to plow stop or to whenever. But if you as a coach can't adapt and make modifications for people with different styles of bodies or even coach to people who maybe think differently than you or have different learning styles than you, like, you know, it can make it such a really difficult space. I love the ways that you're talking about this. They feel so artistic to me because to me, it's more about like your intuition and less about like following some set of instructions. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like you just made me realize something about myself too. I'm a very go with my gut kind of person. Also super appreciate when people do come to me with a disability and they're like, hey, I don't know how to do this in the way that you're asking me to because my body doesn't allow me to do it that way. That to me is so rewarding as a coach to get to work through that with them because I would have never been exposed to having to like learn a different or to teach myself a different way to like approach this trick otherwise you know what I mean and like who knows who I can like pass that on to and help in the future like even in in Derby I'm like some of some of the most difficult people that I had to coach I'm like very grateful for now because if they hadn't like poked me and asked me questions that I didn't know how to answer in that moment I wouldn't have been a better coach because of it so yeah I don't know like try to not get discouraged if you're like put in that situation try to like embrace it because it's gonna make you better as well and mean a lot to that person too hopefully so yeah creativity baby is the name of the game i'm curious just like from a very personal perspective and place you know yeah. what is it like you know if you're having a shitty day are you going to go skate or is it hard to go skate it's it's hard because it's changed a lot over the years i think um i would say right now i'm at a place where if i've had a really bad day it's going to be hard for me to get out and go skate But what I am actually at the point with with my skating is I'm learning to really appreciate the friend group I have that like doesn't make me feel bad if I don't want to skate or sometimes I'll like show up and meet it with this group of friends I have here in Richmond and they'll all be like, "Uh not going to lie, I haven't skated in like three weeks. And I'm like, either. I mean, it usually is more like every other week or something like that at the most, but it is like kind of refreshing to have that like you can tell that they're like struggling with it as well and that to me is very comforting because I think people are just like oh I'm supposed to skate because I'm going to skate with you today and I I, I, like want to keep up with you or whatever and it's like realistically like it takes a lot for me to get out the door sometimes too I do always feel better when I skate which is like hard to remember sometimes of like I I might be on the fence about it and stuff but usually if I just go I'm going to end up having a great time either way um, I also have picked up skateboarding. So there is, if I feel like I've been in a rut with roller skating for a long time, I will pick up board and try something with that because that is going to be fresh and terrifying no matter what, <laughs> probably forever. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of nice to feel challenged again and to push myself in a new direction. It's been a long time or it had been a long time actually. Um, since I learned a new trick in roller skating, I joke all the time I've been doing the same 10 tricks for the past 10 years or whatever. Um, but I just learned 50 50s. So there's that <laughs> <laughs> on narrow trucks, which I feel like is, so, but that was huge. I I was super grateful. I was like hanging out with uh, the CID Milwaukee folks and they were doing 50 50s on this like little chill bowl. And I was like, y'all make me want to try because you're all doing them so well. So very grateful for them because I wouldn't have done it otherwise. <laughs> but I, I, it's nice to have like those small wins, I guess, and to just feel like things are exciting and fresh again and all of that. But there are definitely tricks that I'm just like, yeah, I'm not going to get that and maybe it'll click eventually, but I'm not going to sit down and beat myself up over it too much at least. Uh, so yeah. I'm boring if we all did the same stuff anyways. So when you find yourself struggling to land something, especially when you feel like it's something that you do have within you and you're going at it again and again and again when do you know 
to stop and take a rest. And when I'm yeah. tired, <laughs> when I'm over it, basically. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll get frustrated for sure. But I think I'm at the point now with my skating where I'm just like, if I don't get it after the first like 10 tries, 20 tries or whatever, I'm like, well, that's not going to happen today. I'm going to go do this other thing instead. Also, there's something to be said about doing the same trick over and over and over again until you get it works to a fault and then other times you're just like landing in the same spot and putting an impact on your body and just beating yourself up and internalizing it more and that's going to make it harder to land the trick versus if you stop and walk away do something that you find fun or something else you're working on instead and then revisit it 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 feels a little bit better for me personally um I you know I've been trying monkey flips I think they're called for like a while now I've only landed it like on my feet maybe once and I'm okay with that for right now. I think I just kind of, if I'm at a park session and I feel like throwing it out there, I will, but otherwise I'm not going to let myself like be like, this is what I'm doing today. This is the only thing I'm doing today. Like, cause then I'm, I'm just, I'm wasting my session and would rather, I feel like half of skating is also just going around and socializing with people. And so that's usually what I'm doing. I'm like, all right, I'm going to work on this trick. Oh, I didn't get it. Okay, cool. I'm going to go talk to so-and-so for 20 minutes and then try a different trick and then oh there's skate session okay bye like I'm very much like just rolling up to hang out and chill with folks I guess like mental health stuff and skating just I don't know I try to be transparent about it you know what I mean I feel like if I'm posting about like going through like about a depression and stuff like that it's because I think it's visible with my skating or it may be that I haven't posted in a really long time and I'll feel guilty about it so just being transparent with people about like, hey, this is where I've been and this is what I'm dealing with, I think is a big thing. I think people also find a little bit of comfort in seeing that and knowing that they're also not the only person dealing with those feelings, um, especially if you have a large following. I think it's like good to keep yourself a little grounded in reality with like, hey, like I have a hard time too and I'm dealing with these things and like that's life, um, you know, just keep at it or I'm going to try to keep at it, you know. So, I don't know. Ongoing issues. It's a, it's hard to talk about it, I think, currently, because I am in a good space right now with it. And I think it's a little bit easier for me to talk about when I'm not. It's like a weird thing to say out loud. But I think when I am dealing with like a really severe situation with depression, like I, I had a friend die last year. And so it took me easily like over six months to even get to a good place. And I'm still dealing with like the effects of that and everything. Um, but like, I just knew that I wasn't going to be okay for a super long time. And I had to go and coach at events. I had to host things. I had to like produce content. And I just like couldn't, I could barely like get myself dressed. Like I, you know, and and then even then there would still be like random times where I'd be like hanging out at like a state event and stuff and would just like want to go burst into tears. Yeah. Especially in like a culture that's so kind of like hyper individualistic, you know, that kind of expects us in many ways to not share and then add the layer of social media, you know, like part of what I think I really appreciate about how you share content is that I think it really humanizes you and it humanizes the experience of being someone who, you know, has a a bit, bit, you know, a good following and who is also like you know, very involved in skating through sponsorship and stuff. Like, and I think that type of humanization is, is so important and I don't really feel like we see enough of it. Yeah. frankly, in community. I think it's honestly. really easy for people to lose themselves in social media too. Like I said, I've seen people not be able to like differentiate between their online personality, quote unquote, and then like their real selves. And that's kind of terrifying to me that you could be so sucked into presenting yourself in a certain light for people that you forget who you are at core. So a little bit of it is trying to like also just keep in check that like, hey, this is a part of me. And again, like, If you don't like it, this is me and all of my like faults and everything. And I share as much as I feel comfortable with, obviously, but like it's a part of me. And I think it's kind of great because people will build you up onto this pedestal that I don't always feel like is necessarily deserved in my case. Like I'm just a person that just kind of got lucky in a lot of ways. And I wouldn't sit here and be like, I'm one of the best skaters or whatever. Like, I don't feel that way at all. Like, I think there's so many people that are so incredibly talented that don't get hyped up and also have met skaters that don't have any social media at all that are some of the best skaters I've ever witnessed. So good. That, I like, I'm just like, I <laughs> respect them so much more because they're just like, so usually so gnarly and gritty and I could just watch them for hours and they're creative, but they 
have zero interest in social media. And like, there's something really special about that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, definitely a stark contrast from these, you know, hyper cultivated people that are a brand in and of themselves. It's, it's kind of creepy to think about, honestly. But another thing that I kind of want to touch on and go back to is how you were talking about being super open with how you're feeling and, you know, being at a session or an event and wanting to cry and having to hold back those tears. That's a lot of the reason why we wanted to start this podcast, because I, for one post session, I always want to have a conversation about it and talk about how I felt. Everything that came yeah. Out. yeah, I feel like I require a lot of processing. Post yeah, not gonna lie, I have to meet y'all <laughs> after this because, like, this is probably the first one I've gotten that like feels extremely personal. So, like, y'all gotta come down and skate in Richmond sometimes. Yeah, it's cool as hell. I love Richmond. Yeah, I got a space and I got a park right here. So <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> and how has skating allowed you to or contributed to you being able to process things like loss and family members being hurt or yeah um big question uh so super super complex in a lot of ways I think go through the roller derby experience and through the skate park experience I got to experience uh chosen family I got to experience like other ways of living that I wasn't exposed to as a kid. Like one of my first interactions was like this couple that was like a uh, skater and a ref that were together and they just had these two cute like French bulldogs <laughs> and that was their life. And they would tell me about how they would like go on these trips and stuff like that and like do these fun adventures together. And you could just tell they really loved each other and like that was probably the first time I saw a relationship like that that was just so pure and like so clearly mad about each other and like were content with the idea of them not having children as well. Like they were like, no, this is what we want and this is great and they're still together being amazing, you know? I think like experiencing that for the first time was huge for me of like what the possibilities for my own life could be and like that things didn't have to be so status quo with like how my family brought me up and stuff. As far as processing grief goes, I think... My friend that passed recently was someone I would skateboard with on occasion and stuff, um, but more were just friends that I actually was more inspired to do mutual aid because of them. They were an incredible human that did like court support, uh, bail fund stuff, like super badass uh, human that I'm really sad about and is going to try to not get super emotional right now talking about them. But losing them, like the first people I called, or other skaters that I knew that had interacted with them. Because in my mind, we were also their family and were the people that got to experience them at kind of their purest, happiest self, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. You're, you're exuding like so much joy usually at a session and stuff that like, I don't think people see in other aspects of your life. Like you don't, I don't, my coworkers, I don't think can wrap their heads around what I do in my free time. And it's kind of a shame. Like I, I, in some ways feel sorry for them that they don't understand that feeling and that elation of like accomplishing something and having your friends run over and like cheer you up and scream for you. And like, yeah, just it's overwhelming how many emotions you could experience at a skate session a little bit, whether that's defeat or like something positive. And I think just because this person was a part of my life for only a year, actually, too, which is kind of wild and had such a big impact on me, losing them and then knowing that I was never going to get to skate with them again. And then, but also being able to revisit clips that we have together just is, I'm really, I'm really grateful for that. And now that they've passed, I've also been able to witness how many people in their life that like truly loved them and cared about them, but knew that they also like didn't feel that way about themselves and I had to like continue on with like going and coaching at an event and acting as if everything was okay and stuff when I did really want to be there or something that someone would say would like trigger me and make me super emotional and stuff so like I think that kind of answers your question <laughs> I I feel yeah, like that's yeah. again it's like I'm thinking of it in the current state of where I am with skating and like this has been unfortunately like the past year of like how I've like been trying to deal with like that loss and stuff so mental health and skating were like hugely intertwined for me this year still trying to navigate like 
how I'm going to deal with it when it comes up to be like the anniversary of their passing and stuff. Like, I don't know how I'm going to feel at the moment, but I do know I have friends in Colorado who have been like, when after to visit, we will go and visit like favorite poetry hangout and we'll go to like their grave site because I haven't been able to visit that yet. And like just having that family support that I don't receive from my actual family is massive. And I'm so, so grateful for that because I can't imagine how lonely I would be otherwise. You know what I mean? It kind of sounds like more than like skating. It was like skate community. Yeah. That has really <laughs> helped you, you know, move through your grieving process. You know, like, and yeah, grief is something that I think sometimes you can carry for a really long time, if not forever. So it's like, you're, it's actually just your relationship to grief that's sort of changing over time, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, it sounds like you're still in that process. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think you're right. Like sometimes, you know, you never get over it necessarily. It's like something you're going to carry forever, at least when there's something that's like really had a significant impact on your life. And I find that a lot of people I meet in the state community have that impact. I, on this trip, got to revisit a friend in Chicago. And I just remember sitting down with him and being like, I didn't tell you this the last time, but like, I have so much gratitude for just like getting to sit down and have a conversation with you, like skating with you. Amazing. But like getting to just see them and have like, a personal interaction together and like share stories about our lives that like we don't necessarily get to do because we only know each other through skating. Like, I don't know, it's massive. And I've met so many people in the state community like that that I'm just like, I just want to hear about your life. Like, tell me everything, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's definitely encouraging to hear how your chosen family has really lifted you up after having, you know, a difficult upbringing and a difficult childhood. That's something that I relate to in a big way. I'm happy that you have that. Well, I hope you have that too. I like want everybody to find that. I've seen you talk about organizing as a means of healing. What are some of your most valuable takeaways from, you know, lending an ear and building community, especially for your fellow by POC skaters? Yeah, um, I did this event pre-pandemic called Roll Call with uh, Cuban Missile Neon, who's the new 1984. Four, I want to say, or 94, maybe it's 1994 on Instagram, and Kiana Iwana, and I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Um, but those are like the four core people. And that was solely birthed out of the fact that like there were so many issues in the skate community about diversity that just weren't being talked about. And it was kind of before a lot of these brands were getting directly called out about their lack of diversity and stuff. So it was really cool to like see this kind of like ripple effect of like we had this great event where it was just like primarily uh, the IPOC people, but there we also encouraged everybody to attend after they were given priority. Um, and just for some of the folks that attended, we had this whole session where we just talked about our experiences and like our like backgrounds and our heritages and stuff. And for some of us, that was our first time ever getting to do that. And even in that experience, um, what I have experienced recently is like I've been trying to get more in touch with my indigenous background and stuff, which has been pretty difficult just because like my family history is, again, it's kind of a mess. But going to state in areas that are primarily surrounded by reservations and being able to see and recognize another indigenous person and like find a connection there without even really having to say anything is like an experience that I can't really describe. Like it is it feels so deep and profound to just like share that experience with somebody and be like, I'm connected to you and I see you for who you are in a lot of ways without having to say a word. It's, it's at first for me. And so I've been on my road trips going through that process of like trying to visit areas that I know have like a prominent background in the um, in indigenous communities and are based around reservations and stuff. Uh, it's primarily Montana, this last trip in South Dakota for those exact reasons. But anyways, backtracking a little bit, talking about roll call, when we had this situation for people to share their stories and stuff, it was highly emotional. And so many people were sharing, like, unfortunately, traumatic stories, but there were so many people around them that were like, I've also experienced that and I've never talked to anybody about this and things like that. Um, I think the other thing that I learned in that experience, too, is that trying to be mindful of like when someone conveys their personal situation to you and stuff, if they are another person of color, um, being mindful that like your experiences are going to be very different sometimes and trying to be respectful that like, just because you've had a good experience with a person or individual does not mean that 
this person has had that and just trying to be more open and like respectful of that space because in my situation basically I had like welcomed in like a group of skaters to come to this event to try to like hype it up and bring more to it and stuff like that and it ended up harming a person that was involved with like the planning and everything like that and I just now like looking back wish I had like really like allowed them to put their foot down the way they wanted to and been respectful of their experience like that I think that's the thing is like just being very aware to like in general not even with just the IPOC people being aware that like if someone is expressing like a trauma to you or a situation that they've dealt with like that that is their experience and you just have to trust what they say and just be like you know what I hear you I agree what can I do to make this better for you if anything and just like acknowledging that versus trying to be like ah well I'm sure it'll be fine and like trying to move past and stuff it's like no like yeah they, they feel this way it's sincere to them um and I think that's like with anything like obviously there's been I know more of a public conversation around ableism in the state community as well and I've seen a lot of people push back and be like well I don't know why they're so upset about this or I don't understand why they feel this way because I've never experienced that why don't they just do this other thing instead and it's like because that's you're telling them how to do something when you don't have any understanding of their experience. Like, just say, okay, I hear you. I'm going to try my best to do better. Like, that's just something I want to, like, carry with me in general with my skating from here on out. Like, I just, if someone is expressing to me that, like, they're upset about the way something is done, okay, well, how can I help you or be, like, a part of, like, making things better so that everybody feels welcome and included? Absolutely. Yeah. Because you're doing more than just, you know, listening and empathizing. You're also empowering community by finding actionable points and actually working to to change things. Yeah. It's like we just I think it's like our, our it's human nature to like center yourself. You know what I mean? And like try to relate to somebody else's experience. But like sometimes you just really need to like sit back and be like, thank you for sharing. and. I'm going to do my best to be better on my side of things because clearly this is impacting you in a negative way. And I don't want to do that to you. I yeah. don't cause harm to you. You know, it's right. simple as that. And I do think that as soon as like more people, more brands and companies start to understand that the better they'll be for it, because right now I'm just seeing a lot of like, well, thank you for your sentiment, but we're going to continue on with whatever we're doing versus like trying. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> It's so condescending and it just compounds the alienation and it just creates more division. Yeah. Creates way more division than we really frankly need at this point in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And that being said too, like paying people for sharing their experiences and their knowledge and stuff like that, massive. Because like there are certain people that are out there that are constantly educating us and like they're doing it for free. And I know a lot of them are just like, nah, y'all can pay me. And they're absolutely right. Like a lot of them also have like, work that they're actually physically doing in their day-to-day job that they get paid for so like it makes sense that they would get paid for just putting it out there like you know at least if you're inquiring you know what I mean if you're like asking for advice or help on a project or want their input on how to like market something like if you're going to ask for that like assistance then like pay them for their work you know put in a very broad umbrella but I have like a very specific thing in mind right now so (laughs) (laughs) Anyways. <laughs> no, it's all very appreciated. It's all very appreciated commentary, frankly. I love skating so much and I want to be well-rounded. We didn't really talk about it, but like I've started doing like pole because that is something that separates it a little bit and still fills me up when I can't necessarily find that in skating, just like skateboarding does and stuff. But at my core, in my purest form, I feel like I'm supposed to be a skater. I don't think I'm supposed to be doing anything else. Like, I think I was meant for this, honestly, just because it feels so right, whether it's doing the community outreach side of skating, whether it's just going to the skate park and having wheels underneath me. Like, it it feels like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. You had, like, many beautiful, lovely nuggets of wisdom throughout this conversation. But if there's, like, you know, if there's one thing, you know, that you can kind of leave listeners with as we're kind of saying goodbye piece of wisdom, an idea, a thought, an affirmation. What would yeah. it be? What is it? It's a measure twice, cut once. No. 
<laughs> um, I, I like thought about this one because I feel like there's like three solid pieces of information I could give. But honestly, I'm going to like steal my friend Kate uh, T-Rex your face, who's like one of my favorite people to skate with and one of my favorite people in the world. Also an OG veteran skater. She told me about someone years ago in Derby telling her to respect the fact that you have wheels on your feet and to like <laughs> keep that in mind and everything that you're doing. I think it's like, it's a very funny statement, but it's kind of like when you're learning something new, respect the fact that you have wheels on your feet. Like we're not supposed to be doing this. <laughs> like We're not, we're not <laughs> supposed to fly around bowls all crazy. That's so unnatural. Like, you know, <laughs> Proceed with like caution that respects your body. And that being said, also respect the time and work that goes into it. Um, the second part of that is to me, if you're not falling down, you're probably not pushing yourself. And so if you are trying to learn something and you're falling a lot, it's a good thing. And it's just, again, a matter of how long do you want to stay on the ground for? <laughs> so you know, and you can try again or you can hang out on the ground. That's cool too. But you know, it's just a matter of like, we're not supposed to be doing this. It's a very unnatural thing. Think about all the people in your life that don't roller skate and probably look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> like, have respect for like what you're doing to your body and how you're treating yourself and how you think of yourself when you skate because it's this crazy fucking weird thing that we've picked up. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so T-Rex your face. That's, that's directly from her. Respect the we fact you have wheels on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then again, I, I am a big fan of like, if you're, if you're falling down a lot, it just means that you're trying hard. And if you're someone that's like, I want to learn something new and you're not falling, probably should be pushing yourself a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I think that's pretty much the bulk of it. Um, uh, roller skating will like change your life if you let it, I guess, you know, so. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Without a doubt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much for, you know, taking the time today. This was a pretty long conversation and I, you know, I'm really grateful that you took a chance on us, <laughs> newbie podcast. <laughs> no, I'm so excited to hear it. And, like, you know. um, but I'm it's super honored. I didn't know it was the first one. Your questions are like really well thought out. And like what I was saying before is like, I get, I tend to get asked the same things frequently and it's usually about DIY stuff, but I really appreciate that y'all asked stuff about mental health and you know, like body image stuff and like community and like, cause that's all extremely important to me. And I don't feel like I get the platform to talk about that frequently enough unless I put it out there. So thank you. I'm excited yeah. to hear all the other ones that you do with other skaters, you know? <laughs> but yeah, y'all gotta come visit sometime. This has been, yeah. Neat. I really like appreciate that y'all reached out and like you both seem so amazing. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a thank real pleasure you. to talk to you, especially after like following you for a many, it's just like so surreal for me to be like, okay. <laughs> Here's a certain, and, and again, it's like not to pedestalize, but just like how it is it's funny how like social media can bring people together. And just it's funny to just be like sitting here having this conversation with you. Yeah, that's the yeah. thing. I like, I hate social media, but I kind of love it because I would have never gotten like as many experiences as I had. I wouldn't have gotten to meet y'all. Like it's, it can suck, but the positive things that come out of it are like worth it usually. So, and it's the reality we live in now. So. <laughs> All right, Kathleen, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye, Bye Kathleen.